Uh, Jerry, as you are coming in, uh, let me uh, introduce you to the audience. Um, Jerry Kammer started his uh, journalism career in the 1970s, uh, working for a paper in the in, uh, Navajo Indian Nation in the state of Arizona. Wow, uh, apparently he has great difficulty coming in because so many people in the, in the, in the hallway. Hi, Jerry. Um, please take a seat. Yeah. Uh, let me continue on to uh, introduce you. Now, um, in his journalistic career, I think uh, one of the big things that he did uh, was investigative journalism, as you can uh, find, uh, uh, I think, his information on our web. Now, one big story that he did um, was uh, he found out, I mean, he basically exposed a scandal uh, in which a, a congressman um, sold his house at an inflated price to a defense constructor. <laughs> uh, and that sort of led to uh, 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 a serious expose about, uh, I think, the uh, corrupt dealings right, between that congressman and the uh, defense industry. And for this uh, uh, particular series of investigative stories, uh, he won the 206 Pulitzer Prize. Uh, but even though Mr. Kama has won this Pulitzer Prize, what he's going to share with us is quite a sad story. It's, it's going to talk about from the Pulitzer Prize, I mean, from the Pulitzer to unemployment. <laughs> basically, if I'm reading it correctly, basically in the United States, uh, because of uh, the rise of the internet, uh, because of declining circulation of newspapers, many journalists are working for traditional news media, uh, I mean, are losing their jobs. And uh, Ms. Jerry, have you lost your job? I'm out of journalism now. Oh, okay. I have another job. <laughs> <laughs> still doing writing, but not as a, as a journalist. But okay, uh, let's hear his story, right? Let's welcome uh, Jerry Kammer. I tried to learn when I was working in Arizona. My first job as a reporter was with uh, the Navajo Times. Anyone know who the Navajos are? It's a tribe of American Indians, Native Americans. And my first job was working at the Navajo newspaper. So I tried to learn the language. It's a very difficult language. And I was famous among my Navajo friends for made, making mistakes that were sometimes X-rated mistakes. <laughs> but they, they, found it, uh, they found it very entertaining, and uh, I kept on trying. My name in Navajo, um, my friends, because even in my 20s, my hair was turning white. My name was the man with the white hair, or <laughs> Hastin Bitsi Legai. Hastin, the man, b his, si, hair, Legai. And one time I didn't say C quite correctly, and I ended up saying something very obscene. But <laughs> fortunately, my friends had a great sense of humor about my mistakes. Uh, it is a, an honor and a thrill um, to be here with you in Hong Kong. Uh, I am at the end of my journalism career now. It started in 1974. I was just eight at the time. No, I was 25 at the time. Um, and at that time, I wanted to have adventures. I wanted to see some of my country, some of the world. So I went from the East Coast, where I was born, near Washington, to Arizona. But I have told many young students where I speak in the U.S. that if I were a young reporter starting out today, I would move to China. <laughs> I would learn Mandarin or maybe Cantonese. Um, because I think it's a very exciting time uh, in the history of your country, in the history of relations between your country and my country, and there is a great need for good journalism that will help these two powerful, important countries to understand and to communicate. But I'll leave that up to you because, as I say, my journalism career um, is over, although a part of me will always um, be a journalist, I think. And I still have the techniques and the discipline 
that I learned as, as a journalist. It was a wonderful, wonderful career. And even with all these changes, even though I went from Pulitzer to unemployment, and by the way, I didn't win the Pulitzer by myself. I was part of a group of wonderful reporters. Um, the changes are coming. They're, they're not so intense here in China because you haven't had the terrible recession that we have had. But the internet, of course, is happening everywhere. And I frequently think of um, some words that came from a very famous American journalist from many, many years ago. I could recommend his story to you. His name is Edward R. Murrow, who was born early in the 20th century and who became one of our most prominent journalists, uh, mostly a broadcast journalist. And in the 1950s, he was very concerned about the uh, trivialization of television. If you know trivialization, the making small. He believed that television had a noble mission to inform and to educate and to enhance culture and life and understanding. And he thought that too much of it was going over to distractions, to gossip, to, to, to silly entertainments as he saw it. And he said something at that time that resonates today. He said that unless the people who run television found ways to imbue it, to inject into it human values of real concern and real importance, he said the television was nothing more than wires and lights in a box. And I think we could say the same thing about the internet. The, the power of the internet is extraordinary to inform, to educate, to bring people together. But it also has an extraordinary power just to divert, to distract, to fill our minds with nonsense uh, about the latest adventure of Britney Spears. You know Britney Spears, right? Um, we can fill our minds with junk food and with triviality because it comes at us from all directions through the internet, or we can find more basic things, more important things that will um, help um, inform our societies in ways that, that have substance. And that, I think, is the great challenge as we go forward. Um, it's a challenge, I think, that's a global challenge, and you young people will be making that, that future. I just want to say a few words of, of thanks, if I may. It's, uh, Again, I, I so appreciate the chance to be here, and I want to, uh, to thank the President and Vice Chancellor of Hong Kong Baptist University, Professor Albert Chan, the Head of the School of Communication, Professor Zhao Xinshu, Distinguished Fellow, Mr. Uh, Wayman um, Wong, and the Head of the Department of Journalism, Wang Yu, the Master of Arts in International Journalism Studies Director, Mr. Victor Fung, the Associate Director, Ms. Uh, Robin Ewing. And I want to uh, thank the people with whom I have worked most closely, Ms. Wong Sokling and uh, Lawrence Chang. Lawrence has been wonderful. Without him, I would be pulling my hair out because nothing, he, he makes everything uh, work, everything technical work. And he's a, he reminds me so much of a nephew that I have or of the son of Dan Barr, who is right here with me. You guys have such tremendous talent with all things technical, and we old guys are just amazed and astonished. So we're, we're ready to hand over the responsibility to you, and, and I'll go to a rocking chair somewhere. <laughs> um, let me see, where to begin? Can we start the, um, the PowerPoint? Ah, there it is, ah, okay. I came here as a substitute. Um, for the gentleman in the middle there. Uh, Paul Giblin uh, was originally invited. Paul um, won the Pulitzer last year, along with uh, Ryan Gabrielson there on the right. They also are from Arizona, uh, the state where I worked for most of my adult life. And Paul won the Pulitzer a week after he lost his job. And he is now working as a journalist, uh, doing journalistic things with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Afghanistan, um, writing stories there. Paul could not come, and so he said uh, he suggested me, and uh, 
I told him I will take him out to a very nice dinner next time I see him for, for suggesting that. Now, let me see, I can just, can I pick up the microphone and maybe walk with you? This is the ceremony, the Pulitzer ceremony, where they got the award. This is at Columbia University in New York. It's a great ceremony. It's one, a peak experience, for, I think, for, for anyone uh, who has won it. And there's Paul now. And this is a quote from Paul in the New York Times when his Pulitzer was announced. The paper that he worked for was the, East, was a, the Tribune in Arizona near Phoenix. And this is what he said. He was there for 14 years, had a great run, which means a, a great career. I made great friends and a few enemies. But, but then he became very stoic about what had happened to cost him his job. But things have changed, and newspapers are in a tough situation. We're all adults, and we can see that. So he was accepting his fate um, with great dignity. He's a wonderful guy and, a, and an excellent reporter, and I hope he gets back into the industry because he still has uh, many, many years ahead of him to do good work. This is, um, do you know what country this is? <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure that. Um, this is Arizona, way down here, near California. Some of you, uh, what is the most, does anyone know what famous geographical fig feature is in Arizona? A student? Yeah. Phoenix is famous, yes, it's the big city, it's the capital. How about, it's a big hole in the ground. The Grand Canyon. There we go, thank you. <laughs> the Grand Canyon. Um, and as you can see, it borders on Mexico. And actually, I'll, I, I worked in Mexico long time ago. It was a, it was a great uh, experience working down there. Here's the Grand Canyon. Oh. I'm just going to show you a few slides. This will not be a travel log. Don't worry about that, sir. <laughs> I'm not trying to sell trips to, uh, to <laughs> Phoenix. <laughs> and th this, is the, this is the border. This is the US. This is Mexico. And that is the border between the two countries. I used to cover the border. Uh, Paul and Ryan won their Pulitzer uh, writing a series of stories about a, a sheriff who spent so much time pursuing illegal immigrants from Mexico and other countries that he neglected other responsibilities. Uh, very good documentation of that. But the border is a, a remarkable place. I thought you just might be interested in seeing a few pictures. Not exactly the Great Wall of China here. That's close to a town, as you, and, and this is called the pedestrian fence. It tries to block people from climbing over. And this is a vehicle barrier, which covers most of the border. That's the vehicle barrier again. This is the fence um, again, uh, wire mesh, very easy to climb over, and so many people climb over. <laughs> and in remote areas, the border is nothing more than a few strands of barbed wire. So. The border, to me, is a fascinating, fascinating story. And uh, um, I've always been drawn to stories about the, the meeting place of different cultures, different nations. A lot goes on there. It's very interesting. And a lot of material for reporters in the, uh, in the borderlands. This is uh, not a freeway in Texas, or in Phoenix, I'm sorry. This is built for tourists. This is a place called Tombstone. A very famous event in Tombstone, the shootout at the OK Corral. Anyone heard of that? That's a famous cowboy fight. In, uh, <laughs> and of course, they reenact it every day to get <laughs> tourists in there. And this is Phoenix. This is the city where um, I worked for many years. It's a city in the desert. There's a nice big saguaro cactus. That's the Arizona Republic, where I worked for 16 years. And Dan Barm, my friend here, who's now a very prominent media attorney, worked as a reporter at the Republic before he went to law school. We were um, at Dan's place in, in Phoenix uh, Saturday and picked up the Republic. This is the Arizona Republic. And I was struck at how thin the paper was, is, compared to what it was a few years ago. The sixth largest market, I think, I think it's the 11th largest newspaper in, in, in the country, where there are thousands of newspapers. And we used to have classified advertising that was this thick. And now it has gravitated to the internet. And so tremendous loss of income 
two newspapers um, because of free advertising on the internet. That has translated, of course, to tremendous loss of the ability to pay reporters, which I think is the most important ability newspapers have, actually. They, they this is a few blocks away from the Arizona Republic is the journalism school at Arizona State University. Very new, very modern, uh, very well respected school in, down, in downtown Phoenix. So you can see it's the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. Walter Cronkite, very famous American journalist, one of the most trusted journalists in the country at a time when there were far fewer media than there are now, when there were just three television stations nationally, and he uh, was the top newsman at one of them, and he was frequently called the most trusted man in America. Some people called him Uncle Walter because if he said something, people trusted him. And I think we're not going to have another time when we have one dominant figure from one medium um, because we have so many. We have such a fragmentation of media. Cronkite was born in 1916 and died last year at the age of 92. And this is on the wall of the Cronkite School. Can anyone tell me what political document this comes from? The U.S. Constitution. It's the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and it's part of the bedrock, as we say, the foundation for freedom of expression. It's something upon which newspapers rely, and we have great efforts to defend it. Dan Barr represents newspapers who assert their right to expression and tries to keep, help them get it, from getting into trouble um, with such areas of, uh, as, as libel, for example. Dan will be talking about the importance of media law um, and the role of uh, media law uh, in his presentations. Okay. Wanted to shift gears just, if I may, very quickly and go to my text here. Um, you know, the topic going from Pulitzer to unemployment, you know, not a cheery topic, but uh, certainly, and certainly my story and Paul's story, stories are not important in themselves. They're important only in a sense that they help illustrate what is happening to thousands of reporters um, in the U.S. and in other countries as the industry, as newspapers, as journalism undergo these great um, trans uh, transitions. Um, and I'm just going to give you very quickly, and can we go back to the map? Just real, real quickly, um, the story of, I'm going to talk about going from, from you know, to, to uh, unemployment, a little look at, at the career of one reporter. I was born here. You don't have a checklist. Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> hey, there you go. I could climb up there. Okay. I was born in Baltimore, and we consider Washington to be a suburb of, uh, of Baltimore. <laughs> it's, it's about 30 miles uh, from Washington. I um, had 16 years of Catholic education, the last four of which were in northern Indiana, a place called Notre Dame University, Catholic school. We used to have a good football team, now we can't beat anybody. Um, and then. Um, I was drafted into the Army in 1971, era of the Vietnam War. I don't, that's ancient history, I'm sure, to you all. Um, I, I was against the Vietnam War, but I did not want to leave my country. But I didn't have to worry about it because I failed my draft physical because of sports injuries. Um, but I felt glad to not be drafted, but I, I felt a bit guilty, too, because I, uh, if I didn't go, someone else had to go. I ended up going to Arizona because I wanted to have adventures and I wanted to do something that I thought was like public service. And so I worked as a teacher east of the Grand Canyon on the Navajo Indian Reservation. Um, I was a teacher, coach, and school bus driver. Worked about 15 hours a day at a Catholic school. Loved every minute of it and made about 18 cents an hour uh, <laughs> as a volunteer. 
During that year, my, the engine of my very old car blew up. And I had to borrow $1,600 from my parents to get the engine repaired. That was two years' pay almost, and so I had to get a job. And I got a job working for the Navajo newspaper, and that got me into, uh, into journalism and uh, uh, gave me my career. I ended up staying out in the area. To, I, I wrote a book. I went to graduate school here in New Mexico. I went to work for the largest paper, which is in Phoenix, the capital. And my first job was working in Mexico as Mexico correspondent. Um, just fascinating, uh, fascinating job, and it was possible only because of a special skill, you know, the ability to speak Spanish. And I, I think we're entering an age of specialization. I don't know if the rest of you agree, but the idea of being a generalist, just having general reporting capabilities is not enough, it seems to me, certainly in the U.S. You need to bring an added value, a skill, certainly language skills, and I am astonished at your, your English language ability. Uh, it really humbles me. To, to see how, how beautifully um, so many of you speak, speak English. Um, and if you can bring another special skill, um, be it technical, economic, whatever, I think certainly in the U.S. we're entering an age where specialized abilities are going to be valued. Um, if not, you may be chasing multimedia stories. I, it's an age of multimedia, no question. I think everyone should learn as many skills as possible. But I am a great believer of specialized knowledge and the ability to give something to your newspaper, TV station, radio station that they can't get elsewhere. If you can prov provide that added value, as we call it, you will have an advantage. And the more education you bring, uh, the better um, your opportunities. Okay. Uh, very quickly, I, I worked there in, uh, in Arizona until 2000. I was mostly on the investigative team out there. Then in, in the year 2000, I went back to be the Arizona Republic Bureau in Washington, D.C. That was you know, very interesting, but I, I was a generalist. I would have to write everything from a story about a hearing about water rights or an education bill to, to go to the White House when the Arizona baseball team won the baseball championship in 2001 had to go, and that was a lot of fun, but in other words, I was, I was doing a little bit of everything, and many reporters find that just all the fun in the world. They want to go into work every day working on a new story. They develop a rhythm. They develop a capacity to do a story a day. In small newspapers, uh, young people are having to do two and three or four stories a day. I'm an old man now. That's too much for me. I wanted to specialize, and so when I had a chance to specialize, for the Copley newspapers about Mexico. I did that, that took me to Copley in 2002. And then in 2005, my colleague, Mark Stern, a great reporter and a great guy, broke the Duke Cunningham story, his scandal, which I'll be talking about at length on Friday. And I helped him demonstrate how the story of that scandal was not just the corruption of one man, it was a systematic problem in our, um, in our government based upon our system of campaign finance where members of Congress have to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and they do it too frequently by doing favors for people who seek contracts from the government. And sometimes, as in the case of Cunningham, they end up crying at a microphone and confessing guilt. Uh, that's Duke Cunningham. He started out as a war hero because he was an ace pilot in the Vietnam War, and on the basis of that, he was elected to Congress. And here the subtitle is, we have here, The Extraordinary Saga of Randy Duke Cunningham, the Most Corrupt Congressman, and then in big letters, Ever Caught. <laughs> we suspect that there may have been other congressmen who took more than $2.3 million in bribes, as was documented in, in his case, but we don't know of any cases. Fortunately, we haven't had many, many cases of congressional corruption, but those that we have are, um, are pretty disgusting. Um, this is a case of a man who developed a sense of entitlement, a sense that he was better than everyone else, a sense that he deserved the benefits of, from these bribes and who sold himself, sold his integrity, and uh, sold his, his reputation and his life. He is now in jail in my old home state of, uh, of Arizona, uh, and will be for another four years. Okay. 
This is my very first PowerPoint presentation, so be patient, please. <laughs> I'm not a multimedia guy. You, all you guys can do multimedia? No, I, I can't. Okay, I, I want to talk a bit now about how we got to where we are um, with U.S. journalism. So back to the PowerPoint. Um, can we go all the way to the end of the picture so I can start the end? Thank you. I'm, I'm taking uh, Lawrence home with me, if that's okay. None of the sales. I don't want to buy you, just want to bring you over for a little while. <laughs> this is from a U.S. Senate hearing. Uh, Senator, this is, you can. Read that. Shuttering means closing, okay? This is the sad state that many people are worried about, not just people in journalism, mostly people in journalism, of course, but many people who, can, who are concerned about the way our system works, our society operates, and our, um, our check on the political system are worried about the loss of the capacity of newspapers to do work we used to be able to do because we had so much more money. This is a quote from the old days. The glory of the newspaper business in the United States used to be its ability to match it, its success as a business with self-conscious attention to its social service mission. Both functions are threatened today. Amen. And he wrote that in 2004. Um, I think those of us who are a bit older will look upon the era of the 70s, 80s, and 90s as a golden age because we had a sense of mission. We really believed in accountability reporting, investigative reporting, watchdog reporting. Is that a term that's familiar to you, watchdog? Yeah. You're supposed to bark when you, uh, when you see something bad happening, letting the people know. Okay. Well, uh, we had a lot of money, and, and we thought that was the way of life because we could, we could pursue projects. We could travel. We could spend money to uh, enhance our investigations. I once spent several thousand dollars of the company's money having linguistic analysis of a tape recording done by um, uh, students and a professor at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. Now the paper, the Arizona Republic, would not think of spending that kind of money um, because they are so tight with their money. And why? This is what happened. This is a graph showing the collapse of newspaper revenue um, in a period of just a few years. As you can see, here, here's the, the time frame here. And, and the real collapse, the real slide began around 2006. And as, it say, as we say, it, it fell off a cliff, um, dropping uh, on a yearly basis. And um, Everyone was stunned at how quickly it happened. I think, Jackie, you were talking about the inability to anticipate what was happening, and, but there it is. A great editor, formerly at the LA, LA Times, um, and John Carroll had this to say. He talked about the, the ethics that used to prevail, the spirit that prevailed. Making money was important, but it was also important to serve the community and also to serve journalism. But in now, when you have chains that are publicly owned, that means they're on the stock market. If they're publicly owned, it means people can buy stock in them so they can own a part of them. That just sets up an entire different set of priorities for newspapers. They have to work on increasing the value of that stock. And the other obligations, what reporters believe in, what we all want to do, and wherever I go you know, um, and talk, no matter what country, I, I meet young journalists who have the same values that we had, um, and many of us still have, wanting to serve our societies by doing good, solid reporting. We believe it's a valuable contribution to our society and to our countries. I believe good journalism is a patriotic service, actually. This is what happened in the old days. This is talking about the three um, Greatest newspapers in the U.S., the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, arguably at least the three best. I think other, there would be 
some, uh, dif uh, some debate about that, but no question of, of their importance. All owned until recently by families. The Wall Street Journal has since been sold. The family that owned it sold it. And these families had a sense of what the French call noblesse oblige. They had a sense that owning a newspaper was a public trust, that a newspaper was not like a widget factory to make profit, that it was doing something far more important. And this is still the case at the New York Times and the Washington Post, where the families who control the stock, who control the voting stock at least, um, are committed to that mission and thank Thank the Lord, as we say, that they are committed because they are still excellent newspapers who are dedicated to doing the type of journalism that, uh, that we all believe in. The Sulzberger family owns the New York Times. Iphigen, an unusual name, even in, in, in the U.S., um, was the daughter of, the, of the, the German immigrant who bought the New York Times uh, immigrant from the 19th century. And she grew up at a time when the family was beginning to develop the ethic that it still has. That profit is important. You have to make money to pay your bills. But it's not the most important thing. It's not the ultimate value. Make money, but don't always be determined to make more money more profit by cutting costs. David Halberstam is one of the great journalists of the 20th century in the United States. He's a, he was a hero to many, um, many of us. Um, died in a, in a traffic accident in California a few years ago. This is another statement about the importance of family owned as opposed to corporate owned. The family, many of the families they were residents. They lived in their communities. They felt invested in their communities. They wanted the best for their communities. They did not squeeze every dime, as we say, from their newspapers. And they had this belief that profit was important but not the essential things. Corporations do not have that sense of social responsibility. Indeed, by law, the managers of corporations are required to maximize the value of the stock. That's their duty. So we have these two competing values. And um, that has been one of the primary tensions in, in US journalism, um, especially over the past 10 to 15 years. Oops, that's a repeat. Here's John Carroll again, that great um, editor, talking about what journalists believe. This is what the reporters believe. And I think that was certainly true when I was reporting. We didn't think of it as a business. We recognized that it, there was a business side, but that was not our concern. We weren't working to help make a lot of money. We really idealistically um, were working to do good journalism. And I think now we realize how lucky we were to live in a system that made that possible. That system, of course, is under great threat. And here's, again, John Carroll talking about this entirely two different worlds. I mean, the corporate people look at the reporters, the editors who want to do good work, and they say, what, are you crazy? I mean, your job is to help us make money. And the journalists think, no, your job is to give us the ability to do great journalism. And there is this, this, this tension. Um, Deborah, um, whom, whom, Deborah's not here right now, is she here? Yeah at the LA Times uh, was working with, uh, I think she was there when John Carroll was there, wasn't she? And experienced that firsthand. John Carroll ultimately quit because he got tired of, of making the cuts that were demanded, the cuts in staff, the cuts in journalism. He got tired of saying, stop doing, stop making good journalism, make more money is what he was told. He said, no, I can't do that, and he quit. And that brings up to, uh, brings in mind a, a very famous quote from the Irish poet uh, Oscar Wilde who lived I think from 1850 until around 1900. A cynic is a man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. The price, the monetary value, but the higher value is now a cynic uh, doesn't care about. I think we have very cynical management in many of our newspapers. 
and Russell Baker is saying, this is what it comes down to. And uh, this is a good big difference between you know, our societies. And I think that those who believe in um, capitalism all the way are, uh, are missing something. Free market capitalism doesn't really work in newspapers. Um, if all you want is to make money, if you don't have a social um, function, ethic, uh, to me you're just a, a shark out consuming. I work for Gannett uh, at the Arizona, the Arizona Republic, bought Gannett in 2000. It was one of the reasons I left to go to Washington. I wanted to get away from it all. And since this is a, a conference about, about Pulitzers, there is a, a, a good series on the internet. Uh, a, a, f a man named John Temple did interviews with people who uh, had been part of Pulitzer Projects and are no, no longer in it. Um, he did uh, interviews with about eight of us, uh, with Paul Giblin, with Deborah Nelson. And this is actually a, something that I told him. When Gannett bought the newspaper, Gannett is based in, I don't have my map up, um, near Washington, they turned Arizona into a colony. And the purpose of a colony is not to serve the people who live there. The purpose of a colony is to make money for the home country. And the home country was the Gannett corporate offices. Um, and that's one of the reasons I am uh, glad I don't work for Gannett anymore. <laughs> John Temple himself, uh, the man who did those series of interviews, he worked at the Rocky Mountain News in, in the state of Colorado, beautiful state. Um, Printed its final edition last year. He's now out of uh, newspaper journalism and working on a, um, a community website in Hawaii that's uh, trying to help stimulate civic discussion. Again, John Carroll. <laughs> I think John Carroll is a very wise man. So he's what's saying. The rules have changed. The world has changed. The world has been turned, as we say, upside down from the old models. The owners got rich, and now something we hear a lot, the golden age is over. Okay, so we've had some very um, colorful comments about, you know, the terrible state of journalism. Some people are, at, you ever heard the phrase crying in their beer? <laughs> There's been a lot of crying into beer slow, unstoppable, train ride to hell. He actually said it began well before the internet. Here's another metaphor about how we old guys feel that um, a melancholy, meaning very sad, is melancholy, that the press is yesteryear, as in yesterday, a horse-drawn buggy on an eight-lane interstate highway. Can you imagine that? How sad can you be if you're a technology? And here's one more. John Carroll says, we're the last steam engine. So all these metaphors, these ideas of being antiquated, of being old and of no current relevance. Uh, this is a feeling in the press. Oh, here's a final metaphor. We're going the way of the dodo bird. Dodo bird is extinct. So this is the, the depressed point of, uh, of view. This is the woe is us view of journalism. And it reminds me of a song that was, a very famous song that was written back in 1931. 1931, anyone know what was happening economically on the world stage in 1931? The Great Depression, it was called. It began in 1929 with the stock market crash and spread around the world. And that followed the decade of great prosperity of the 1920s when this song is written in the voice of someone who was a construction worker, who had a feeling that we were building great things, that we had done great things. And um, now these great things seem to mean nothing. And then the great line, brother, can you spare a dime? This is a very famous song. And uh, I would sing it for you, but I don't want to make you all sick before lunch. <laughs> so I, I won't do that. Um, Again, this is a poll of newspaper journalists themselves and how depressed many, especially it's, there's a young old thing going, going on here. You know? The people who are most upset are people who have been in the business for 10 or 15 years um, and who were dependent upon that model, are trying to raise their children, pay a mortgage, 
and are losing their jobs. I mean, that's devastating. Um, there's, a, there's a feeling of depression. But here's the, here's the paradox. This is from David Ignatius, who was here this week. There is a, the newspaper websites are being read by many, many more people than used to read the print version, but it's just not generating the income. So newspapers have many more readers, but many fewer dollars. Um, and of course, most of them are free. And uh, as the saying goes, free is not a business model. <laughs> so what do we do? New York Times starting, I think it's January 1st, isn't it? It's going to be going to start using uh, charging. You'll get a certain number of, of, of uh, stories you can read for free once you reach that limit, you'll have to pay. Um, and so there are other thoughts about what can, you, what can be done to make it work. Nonprofits, which are philanthropic organizations, are supporting journalists. Um, individual donors can bring in some money. Corporate sponsorship, which I don't like because I don't want corporations. But, but if that's what it takes under the right circumstances with the right restraints, maybe. And then membership, where people – this is the model for our national public radio. Do any of you – I think Lawrence was telling me you read – you listen to national public radio, NPR, on the internet. Uh, it's a great, it's a great national, national service. And many of us pay $100 a year or whatever to help support it. And it also gets a little bit of government, government money. But then here's the problem with, with, um, with the model of, of charging people. You know, there's so much free stuff out there that those who charge may face a failure. It's a big gamble because why should uh, – a lot of people are going to say, why should I pay 50 cents to read your story when I can find something very similar, if not the exact same story, on Google News? You know? And so I think what we need – is a broad civic sense of the obligation, sort of a moral obligation, not to take something for free when you realize that it has some value, to help sustain this type of journalism. And it, again, the question goes back to what is the cost? This is Alex Jones, former New York Times reporter, author of Losing the News. We are losing the news. And he says, we don't know what we're missing if we don't have reporters out there not able to do the stories. I mean, if this collapse had happened a few years earlier, Duke Cunningham would probably still be in Congress, still taking his bribes. There is no set of eyes watching guys from, um, like Cunningham from regional newspapers. Um, that, is, that, that function is not being performed, at least under the model that uh, made it a regular part of journalism. Maybe these new services will be able to do it. Okay. Now, a lot, a lot of people are saying, okay, guys, stop crying in your beers. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Put away the violin with the sad music. <laughs> stop the mourning. And this is M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. English has so many homonyms, the words that sound like, of course, mourning means the grieving part of it with the U. And the wailing means the crying hysterically. We've got to get on to building things. And Danny, this is obviously a chaotic, unpredictable time. Only those who are able to creatively transform will survive. But here's the good news. The young Americans, the students your age, are not intimidated by all of this, as I'm sure you're not. You're all excited about the internet and about multimedia. You feel comfortable with it. You know, Lawrence, as I say, reminds me so much of young people I know back home. I think you, your brains are just rewired or something, and uh, you're so good at it, and you're going to be comfortable with it. My wife is a professor at Penn State University, Pennsylvania, in the School of Communications. She says that young people are not at all intimidated. Where, where the older folks see only destruction, the young people, she says, see opportunity. They're going to, to develop the skills and take our place and make things work. Um, they're optimistic about it, she says. But then, again, we have the other argument, again from Led Dowdy. Um, 
you know, the internet can, is great. You can have bloggers doing, you know, putting out lots of stuff. You can have a lot of things that are done quickly and, and glamorously and multimedia with sound and light and whistles and uh, it can look good, it can sound good, it can be entertaining, but does it have substance? Or is it junk food? And, and Len Downey says, look, the crisis um, is not in newspapers. We can get by without the old print newspaper, but the crisis is in getting the news. Where are the reporters going to come from? Because the internet now relies mostly on reporters from newspapers to do the really substantial interpretive investigative work to the extent that it's done. But this gets back to um, an inspirational figure for me. I understand that this book is used in China. Are you familiar with the elements of journalism? Um, I've heard that, it's, that it sells quite a bit. Actually, no, Bill Kovic is a friend of mine. Um, and I've got two copies here. One will go to the first person who can tell me Mr. Pulitzer's first name, but I'll ask me a student. What was Pulitzer's first name? Very good. It's an autographed copy from Bill Kovic of the Elements of Journalism. That'll be two dollars. Okay, give me just a second. I more prizes? How much time do, do I hope we... you brought enough for everyone. It's about time. Yeah, right. It's about time. It's about time. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, I guess I need to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Can, can we take two minutes just to show? Can we show the, uh, the clip? Now, um, I was going to tell you about the Kovic Code and about the idea of journalists as doing something heroic and the ability to do things that, which are really exciting. How many of you have studied mythology? Ever heard of Joseph Campbell? Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey. The hero goes away from the safe place, goes out into a place that's new and, and dark and maybe dangerous and gets knowledge, information, and brings it back to the people. That's the story of Prometheus who stole fire from the gods and brought it back, right? I think that journalism as it, at its best does what heroes do. We go out into confusing areas that can even be a, a little bit dangerous or, that aren't understood, and we gather information that's useful, and we bring it back to our people, and it gives them power, and sometimes it helps set, set them free. We've got to be really careful about thinking of ourselves as heroes because, boy, you can get in real trouble if, if it goes to your head. Duke Cunningham went to his head. Look where he is. But I encourage you to develop a, a poetic sense, at least this, about the value of what you do. Um, and just very quickly, oh, I guess I can't. I was going to show you a poem. We'll go back to that. But just a little bit of comic relief, if I could. This is a movie. Oops. Yeah, that, that's, that's the quote from Joseph Campbell in a book, uh, a wonderful, wonderful book. He says that the story of the hero is really the same for, for many cultures. Um, the, uh, from Jesus to Prometheus to Buddha, this is the, the difficulty they go through to come back and, and bring vital information. Um, I think when you're working and, and just learning knowledge, you're learning to think linearly. You're developing the mind of a scientist, which is very important. We want to be able to test what we do. But don't lose your literary sense. You, from, you come from a culture that for thousands of years has valued its poets. Uh, read poetry, too. That, I think, nour nourishes your soul and can help shape your writing as a journalist. This, to me, is my favorite, one of my favorite poems from a British um, poet. But he talks about what is precious. This, this, is, this is what he says is most precious. And I, I love those last lines. Born of the sun, they traveled a short while towards the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. And he also talks about never to allow gradually the traffic to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. 
Again, don't let the trivial stuff overwhelm the really good stuff that's trying to grow within your soul and try to find a way to bring that into your, into your journalism. Okay, away from all that serious stuff, now to some funny stuff. Just two minutes of a film that was based on a period in the 1920s that makes fun of reporters who did not take serious their, their responsibility to do honest journalism, who, did, who looked for the sensational stuff. This is a story about an editor who's trying to get a reporter to secretly take a picture of a hanging so that they can get the story out very quickly and make a lot of money. This is a great movie. It's a lot of fun. It's called The Front Page. Uh, I think um, I can recommend it. It's, it's a lot of laughs, but it also makes a few serious points. Okay. Just about two minutes of this, if we can. Mr. Johnson, I'm so glad Mr. Bird has been looking for you all over. Congratulations, step right up, shake my hand. Hi, Ellie. My baby told me that you. It's the holiday or something. Get those two tones. Yeah, where did you steal that cane? Look at him. Where's the whale? Congratulate me, I'm in love. Where the hell have you been? Well, let's see. I had a haircut, I got a manicure, and I did a little shopping. I had Duffy. Yeah. Now, what the hell are you dressed up for? You're not covering a polo match, you're covering a hanging. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you Now, listen, kid, tomorrow you and I are going to stand this town on its ear. We are. Every damn newspaper's going to have the same damn story on that execution, but we're going to scoop them all. Because you know what goes in there? A picture of Williams swinging by the neck. A picture? A photograph for the first time anywhere, exclusive of the examiner. What are you talking about? That's against the law. You can't bring a camera in there. Who's going to know? Here. I have this specially rigged up. You clip it to your ankle. You run the tube up your pants leg. Make a hole in your pocket. The minute Williams drops through that trap door, you lift your pants leg and squeeze the ball. Clever? <laughs> At 7 o'clock, the guy kicks off. At 7.03, you're out of the jail yard. There's an ambulance waiting for you with a dark room and a typewriter inside. You take off with the sirens going. While you're batting out the story, they're developing the negative. At 7.22, the picture gets to the engraver, we start setting up your copy. At 7.56, we replate the front page. At 8.12, the presses start rolling, and at 8.47, you're out in the street with an extra. How's that? Walter, you'll either get the pure surprise, or you'll get a year in the clinic. You and me both, we're in this together. Now, what I want is about 1,200 words. You know, lots of atmosphere. Well, either, either a Pulitzer Prize, either a Pulitzer Prize or a year in the clink. Okay, so, um, I'm glad we got the Pulitzer and this guy got the year. In the, actually, four, uh, eight years in the clink. So. Sorry, we don't have time for more. Thank you. Uh, let me see. I have to say, wait a, one final thing, if I may. I have to say. All right, thank you, Jerry, for your very exciting presentation about journalism. Um, I think Jerry's message seems to be that, I mean, even though traditional newspapers may be declining, but we still uh, need good journalism, right? And that's the future that uh, I hope all of you will help to uh, uh, sort of continue to uh, create. Now, any questions for Jerry? Any questions? Any questions? Question number one, two? Okay, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Try to think of one, right? Now, I, I just uh, uh, like to share with uh, uh, the, the audience my experience. Right? I had the good fortune of going to uh, Germany in May this year, where quite a number of news publications are owned by non-profits. For example, Das Spiegel, the uh, very uh, uh, famous international uh, news magazine, is actually, uh, I think, owned by the staff themselves. And I think in Germany, uh, 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 quite a few uh, newspapers are also owned by uh, non-profit making foundations. I just wonder uh, whether this is going to be something that uh, become more and more popular in the United States. First, I must say I'm not very knowledgeable about that. I do know that we've had for a long time uh, one uh, uh, St. Petersburg Time Times has been owned by a nonprofit. That is certainly something that is being considered, and there are efforts to pass laws that, that would remove some of the tax penalties that would currently apply. The transferring of uh, a large corporation sometimes has very involves very severe taxes, um, 
And, um, but that is something that many people believe is part of the way to the future. I see. This law, yes, no question. Any questions? Now you can uh, direct questions at both uh, Professor Benesinski and uh, Mr. Kama. I'm going to cry if I don't get one question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Microphones first. Uh, hello. Uh, my, my name is Joy. And uh, I'm, uh, you mentioned in your speech that uh, you said uh, the tension between corporate supervisors and journalists, right? I studied business management in a bachelor, so I'm just wondering, uh, isn't that uh, another model of running like the newspaper of like saying uh, being profitable is also can help stu the journalists in a way? Thank you for making that point. That's a very good point, a necessary point. I'm not against capitalism. I think newspapers need to make money. The question is how much? <laughs> is it always more? I mean, Gannett at the Arizona Republic was not – most corporations are happy if their profit margins are 10 percent. When Gannett bought the Arizona Republic, it wanted 35 percent. See, I think that's obscene because they're taking money that could be used to provide quality journalism and they're using it to maximize profitability. I think capitalism is a great system when it is capitalism that has a social conscience. Now, I'm not advocating th an overthrow of the economic system in the United States, but I am saying that we, that we have capitalism that has gone too far. We saw that with Wall Street, with the current collapse. This is capitalism without a conscience. Do you and think Wall Street Journal does a really good job in terms of uh, their – because from what I know, they're kind of the only one that their online subscriptions is really going up and they are making profits. The journal's able to do that. The journal has a very specialized audience that's very affluent and willing to pay. The New York Times is trying that. Uh, I think what we're seeing is um, a polarization. Uh, we're, I think those at the top are going to survive, but we're going to have many below that who won't be able to survive. Um, and I, I think we're seeing uh, uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. We're also seeing that in American society, and I know that talking with some people here, that's a concern in, in Chinese society as well, that uh, we're having too much of a concentration of wealth at the top. Um, that is very destabilizing uh, in, a, in any social system, I, I think. But we need good, smart, well-managed newspapers that have a heart. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for your speaking. I um, appreciate, and I, I, I think uh, I see. I saw that you put the see truth from the facts at the end of uh, PPT, and uh, I, I just uh, a question. Uh, I know some press are uh, uh, fring on other countries. Uh, they betray their hearts. Uh, I, I want to know they just uh, they just for profits or other other reasons, because uh, journalists uh, always betray their heart to report things. They they not seek truth from facts. So I w I want to know how do you, uh, how do you think that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I, anyone know who this quote uh, originates with? Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao. He was a journalist, <laughs> was he? I, again, I think journalists have to have a heart as well. Yeah. Th this is human nature. We have um, people who seek, most of all, fame. They're driven to get money. Um, we've had some people in the U.S. who have been so driven to win a Pulitzer that they have made things up. Uh, we have another great movie. Uh, 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 about there's some really good movies that talk about the ethics of Shattered Glass of, about a young reporter who was a brilliant writer and for, who for a while was very famous, but it, it, they found out that he invented things entirely. So now he's completely disgraced and he brought shame to, to journalism. I mean, we're going to have business people who own newspapers who are going to be corrupt and we're going to have 
journalists who are going to be corrupt. Um, and we need to do all we can to identify them and get, and get them out of, um, out of journalism. But the corporate guys are here to stay, I'm afraid. All right, I think there was a hand over there. Uh, Hossein. Uh, thank you for your speech. My question is, uh, do you really think that the, only the, the, the print papers can be called newspaper? Because we currently, you know, a, a lot of newspapers have set up their own uh, own websites on the internet, and as a reader, I, th I think it makes no difference for me to read it online or read it on the paper. So we are, and we are always talking about that the, that the newspaper is uh, is dead, is right. dead, uh, or is going to is dying. Right. And uh, do you really think that it's it's dying? And I think if, if uh, I think the the news on the internet it can also be called a newspaper. It's very good, very good point. We don't need to have it on print. Uh, I think, again, it's a generational thing. Those of us who grew up with newspapers, we, we feel it's almost like a teddy bear. We want to hold it. <laughs> uh, but you young people, and it's the same, I think, in other countries, why do we need a newspaper? In the States, some people, they call it the dead tree industry. You know? and Clearly, we're gravitating toward the internet. And you're, you're more comfortable with it. I still like to hold a newspaper in my hand. The, the evolution of the iPad is very Im important because the iPad is making the, the experience more pleasant. Uh, but this simply cannot survive. When you look at the cost of not only buying the newsprint by, by the ton, but distributing the newspapers with, with large fleets of trucks, um, and you put up against that the internet, which operates on electrons that have no uh, added cost. I mean, it, there's no competition. Um, the problem is that we haven't figured out a way to make money with the internet. We're still making money by selling full page ads on newspapers because there are enough of us old guys <laughs> who want this. But you young people around the world are going to have a different world. But take care of my old world, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a problem for Professor Benazinski. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, my my problem uh, my problem is that the people in mainland China they cannot use YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, and also Google has already with from mainland China and uh, my problem is that do you think that the uh, um, de development of uh, journalism with the help of social media uh, we are always staying this kind of a dilemma or just uh, be destined to die thank you Uh, that, that's a really, really good question. I've worked um, a lot in mainland China. I've been there nine times working with newspapers there. And I know that the challenge there is that um, the government philosophy and laws um, create a different climate. I can't help but think that that's going to end at some point. I don't think that the force of the internet is going to be denied by anybody at some point. Maybe North Korea. <laughs> um, um, but I th and you know, and you're already seeing young people finding ways around that. You know, there are all kinds of backdoor ways, and uh, once you go through that back door, you can't close it again. So I think it's a challenge. Um, I think it probably needs to be addressed one step at a time, so you don't run into chaos. But you're going to find a way for the internet to reach across those boundaries sooner rather than later. But do you think that this problem could only be solved with the very, um, very extreme political reform? I think extreme political reform might come after extreme technological revolution. Okay, thank you. I you know, let me, let me give you one example. A lot of people equate what's going on right now with, with the press to the same thing that happened when Gutenberg invented the Bible. And before the Gutenberg Bible, I mean the Gutenberg Press, um, the church owned religion and the church owned all of the information about religion. The church owned the right for people to have access to their own language and therefore their own relationship with God. Once the Bible was printed on the printing press and got into the hands of the masses, 
the church itself had to change its way of doing things. I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just the way it happened. And I think we're in the exact same era. I think this is the 21st century version of the Gutenberg Press. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, over there. Uh, two simple questions to, uh, to Jerry. Uh, uh, the first is, do you believe the family-owned uh, newspapers will be in s uh, survival in the future? The second, sorry. Uh, I'm interested in the, the film you show us at the end. Uh, is that the real story about the New York Daily News in the 1920s? Thank you. To answer your second question first, it's about a, um, it's based in Chicago, and some of the events are true, but most of them are not true. However, there was actually um, a, f a photograph taken with this technique yes, yes. of a hidden camera. And it yes. it, it the New York Daily News, right? What, was in it the, New York. Was New it York. in New York? Yeah. I thought it was, you may be right. Yes. I thought it was Chicago. But in uh, the uh, electro chair, yes. a lady, a s uh, executive, right? Okay, thank you for that, yeah. And your first question is so important. I, I think that if the New York Times became a Gannett-type corporation where the stock value is the driving concern, it would be a tragic loss. The Sulzberger family still controls the voting stock. There are two tiers of stock, but those who, who have non-voting stock are trying to get voting power, and there's a battle. Now, the family that owned the Wall Street Journal sold to Rupert Murdoch a few years ago. And I don't know, Jackie, do you think the New York Times and the Washington Post are going to stay privately owned? I can only hope so. I mean, I don't know. You know, if, if you're talking about interesting movies, there's a very, very good old journalism movie that if you can find it, I highly recommend. It's called Deadline USA. And it starts Humphrey Bogart. It's hard to get, but, you know, hunt around, you'll find it. And it's the story of the New York Daily News, basically. But it's a paper called The Day, The New York Day. And it's about a family that owned this newspaper and that had the family values that you find at the New York Times, the Washington Post. And then the ownership, the, the parental group died, and the children had to decide what to do. And they were split because some of them wanted to take the money out. So they sold to a corporation, and the newspaper went in the tank and folded. Um, and it was a very good, it's a very good cautionary tale, and it was done in the 1930s. It's a really interesting uh, movie. Uh, but it, it's, a hard, it's a hard issue right now, um, just a very hard issue. I think the big, the big newspapers, the Times, the Post, um, Wall Street Journal, the question is what happens when Murdoch dies, because his son has shown no interest in the paper, apparently. But I think the big three or four have a shot at getting through this technological revolution and coming out at a place that makes a lot of sense and will continue to make money. It's the regional papers in the U.S. that are really in trouble. The papers in places like Minneapolis and Seattle and, and San Francisco that don't have that big national platform and can't quite afford to ride out this way. I really believe in the teaching value of, uh, of an excellent uh, movie, and we have many of them, I think, about uh, uh, journalism in the U.S. This is a movie about the most famous investigative story in the history of Older Watergate. Okay. And it's important for you young people to know that the Watergate story was broken by two very young, inexperienced reporters. When they started to cover the stories, there were older reporters who tried to take the story away from them, saying, oh, these guys are too young, they don't know. But the editor said, no, they've got the story. They're young and they're hungry. <laughs> so let them go. And they did a great job as young reporters working hard. Um, I think that, that was an inspiration for thousands of young Americans to go to journalism school. I think it can be an inspiration for young journalists everywhere to know that you don't have to be a gray hair like me to go out and get stories. If you have the drive and the determination and you bring the right values and the right set of skills and the great determination, you can do it. Um, so a, a great inspirational teaching tool. I recommend it to, uh, to everybody. And really good about some of the techniques of reporters and, and what do you do when you have 20 doors shoved in your, in your face because people won't talk to you. you. You have to be able to accept that. All right. Any other questions? Here. Here. 
Oh, okay, fine. Okay. Uh, my question is really short. Uh, I want to know your, both of your views on The Daily Show and John Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, John Stewart in The Daily Show. I love him. I mean, he's so entertaining and so smart. Um, are you asking it what my views about whether or not what he does is journalism? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's interesting. He doesn't do journalism. He takes journalism and thinks about it really, really intelligently and puts a satirical and ironic spin on it. He's not originating journalism. He's in some ways a very smart aggregator. However, many, many, many young people get most of their news from Jon Stewart. And you know what? As long as they're getting it, it's fine with me. Amen. <laughs> All right. Okay. With that note, I think we have to close this uh, session. Uh, it's uh, well, well past time. Well, I, uh, let me thank Professor Benesinski and Mr. Kemmer for sharing their experiences with us. Okay. You're welcome. Right. Okay. Um, I understand some of you are visitors from uh, Macau and other parts of the country. Uh, let me just uh, tell you that uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner will be uh, with us for a week. Tomorrow there's going to be another open lecture uh, at the same time at 10 o'clock, um, at which Mark Fior, an uh, animated cartoonist, will share his views. All right? Okay. Thank you very much for coming and bye-bye. <laughs>